Hi, my name is Pete Scazzaro. I want to welcome you today to the Emotionally Healthy Leader Podcast. So good to be with you. Today, our theme is Journey Through the Wall. It's part four in this series on emotionally healthy spirituality. Now, the impetus for this series is the release uh, this past month of the expanded Emotionally Healthy Discipleship course, part one and two, the core of which is emotionally healthy spirituality. And so this launch of a new refresh of our EH Discipleship course materials is the fruit of years of work. And Jerry and I are just thrilled with this expanded edition of the spirituality workbook revisions, as well as the new videos uh, that go along with each session and the fact that there's free access to those streaming videos uh, once you are get the workbook and there's no more buying of DVDs and all that, which is just great. So let me invite you to again, download session one of the workbook and a free session video here at emotionallyhealthy.org slash preview. That's emotionallyhealthy.org slash preview. Just check that out. Uh, I think you'll be very glad you did. So my plan over these next few weeks is to continue the series that uh, supplements uh, the chapters and the reading and the doing of the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course. So we began in uh, part one by looking at the false self, the problem of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, that we're doing way too much, uh, more activity than our inner life can sustain, and as a result, uh, have walk around quite a bit in a false self, much like Saul. And then we looked at part two at David and the call of God for us to live out our true selves in Christ. And we began that pathway into our true selves. And uh, and then in part three, we looked at Joseph going back to go forward and how important it is to maturely look back at our gifts and legacies that came out of our families of origin and our cultures. And then what do we want to take with us into the future? And what do we need to discard? Uh, And we looked at Joseph, who is uh, well integrated, abiding, deeply alive, uh, he's actually someone who's been through walls uh, and uh, is a great model for us. And this week, uh, we're going to get into journey through the wall, uh, another very large theme. Because of our need to integrate uh, walls and dark nights uh, of the soul so that God can purify us from falseness on multiple levels. He can mature us and free us. Uh, so we see him as he really is and not as a projection of what we might think who he is to be. This was birth really journey through the wall out of uh, our own story, my own walls that I was hitting of depression or despair, depression and despair and betrayal and suffering. I didn't have a theology or framework for it uh, as I began leading our church. And I saw others quit and drop out. And uh, I was taught uh, the prayer of Jabez, which is a nice summary of what I think was in my theology uh, which comes out of First Chronicles 4.10. As he, there was a famous book written about it many years ago, and uh, it's based on uh, this text, which writes, which says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, O God, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Well, who wouldn't like that prayer? God, free me from pain. Give me everything I want. Grow my church. Uh, bless me. And uh, so like most Christians and pastors, if I may add, I organized my life around freedom from pain and avoidance of pain, not the embrace of it to find God in it. And so like many, I came kicking and screaming into this theme, journey through the wall. And this is so important for us to get at, especially those in leadership, because uh, it is so central to our journey uh, in following Jesus. Now, the Christian life being understood as a journey is a very important metaphor in scripture. Uh, We see that throughout scripture and stories like ancient Israel or the 12 disciples, but it was written about and has been written about throughout the history of the church the last 2000 years. It's a fascinating study to begin to pull out how it's been written about uh, by different men and women. We see it, for example, in 1 John, where he writes about to dear children, then to young men and women, and then to fathers this idea of a journey. We see it in Augustine and Ignatius and Evelyn Underhill. We see it in John Climacus in the 600s, a famous writer from the Eastern Orthodox Church. And he writes about the failure of beginners in the Christian life who are mostly greedy. And then those who make progress, who uh, yet their failures come from a high opinion of themselves. And, and then those who are growing in maturity or perfection that their failures are around judging their neighbors. And again, the Middle Ages, they had their own schematic of beginners or 
who were going through purgation or purging, and then the proficients, those in the middle who were in illumination, and then those who gained perfection or unitive oneness with God who grew up. And so again, it's all these different images, and they're all, you know, many of them are very, very helpful as we think about the Christian life as a journey. And what I did here was I, I took the work of um, Gulick and Hagner, and uh, uh, Hagner was a, uh, the, the, Robert Gulick was a uh, professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, and uh, Hagner was a spiritual direct, is a spiritual director. And uh, their combination of this book called The Critical Journey just was really uh, a, a wonderful bringing together of many streams of history and taking the image of a Christian life as a journey uh, that I found very helpful and accessible uh, for folks I was leading in our local church. And so I began to work with that over the years and combining it with the work of John of the Cross in Dark Night of the Soul, someone who I'd read quite a bit at a, quite a bit of over the years. And again, this idea of the journey uh, as the Christian life is such a helpful one because it gives you the sense of movement, the stops and starts, and this idea of detours and and then delays, and it gives you a kind of a long view of, of the Christian life. And so uh, uh, the schematic of Hagner and Gulick looks something like this, stage one, and you'll find this again in the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality book and workbook. Stage one is uh, life-changing awareness of God. I, I basically come to Christ, begin my relationship with him. And stage two is discipleship. I begin to learn about God and what it means to be a follower of Christ. I, I get rooted in the Christian disciplines of the faith. Stage three is the active life. I, this is like the doing stage. I get involved. I'm actively working for God. I'm serving him. I'm bringing my talents and gifts to bear uh, uh, into God's kingdom. But stage four is where I hit a wall at some point and I begin the journey inward. And the wall and the journey inward are closely related, but it's the wall that often drives us to the inward journey where I, I've got it pressing what's going on inside of me because I am stuck. And then stage five, as I move through the wall and this journey inward, I come out and I once again go out in the journey outward. I've passed through these crises of faith and I've done this intense inner work and now I begin to go outward doing for God. But it's different now because while I may do the same external things I did before, like preach and lead and uh, give my talents and treasures, I'm now doing it out of a new center, a grounded sense of God. Uh, from a deeper place than I did previously. And then finally, stage six is a total transformation by the love of God. Uh, I've been made perfect in love, which was a phrase of John Wesley's. Um, I, I really truly embody that the love of God is the beginning and the end of everything. Loving God, loving others, loving myself. And this perfect love has now driven out all fear. And my life is one of surrender and obedience to his will. But it's the wall that represents the most far-reaching change of any of these stages. And it's necessary if we're going to grow into mature, deep people. And it's rightly been said that 85% of people are stuck at a wall, or Christians are stuck at a wall, uh, because they don't have a theology for it, a framework for it, don't know what's going on. Um, because that's the place where we find out that our faith isn't really working real well. And we've got a lot more questions than we had before. We have many few answers. And so I just thought of some of the walls that uh, I've seen around me in just the last few years. It's included a neighbor who unexpectedly lost his job after 36 years where he'd served faithfully and was called in his office one day and basically told uh, you and along with a few others, we you know, reorganized the, the company and we're letting you go. And that was his notice. The sense of betrayal was devastating. Uh, another was a fear and anguish uh, of not being able to get pregnant uh, of a married couple. Another had to do with the death of a son, a tragic death of a son. Another was the untimely death of a spouse after 25 years dying of cancer after a very slow two-year process. Uh, another had to do with a, their son being put in prison uh, for seven years. Another had to do with the hopelessness of a painful marriage that seemed to be going nowhere. Another wall uh, of a recent person I, I spoke to was turning 40 and not being yet married. Another had to do with a, a, a friend who whose business that he had built for 25 years, um, uh, 25 best years of his adult life, basically was lost in a fire. 
uh, and then being falsely accused um, by the government of something. And it was just a mess and ended up being the newspapers. And again, just wall after wall. And then another way to do with premature death of a, um, of a mom uh, from COVID. And then finally, a person who went through a severe disillusioning church experience uh, with a leader they well respected. I summarize it like this uh, in the EH Spirituality book. At Walls, we end up questioning ourselves, God, and the church. We discover for the first time that our faith does not appear to work. We have more questions than answers, as the very foundation of our faith feels like it is on the line. We don't know where God is, what he is doing, where he is going, how he is getting us there, or when this will be over. I've experienced uh, five to six major walls in my life, each one of which has changed me uh, forever. Uh, the first well, was in 1994, actually, when I, one, of our, one of our congregations split, and uh, I had felt betrayed, I outraged, uh, my faith was really shaken, uh, everything in me wanted to quit Christianity. In fact, that's one of the ways you know you're at a wall, when everything in you wants to quit. Uh, again, there's a difference between walls and trials. Trials are traffic jams and annoying bosses and, uh, you know, the car breaks down. Uh, those are James 1 trials. But walls are different. Uh, walls are larger. They're David, David fleeing from Saul for 13, 10 to 13 years in the desert. It's, the walls are Jesus hanging on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Walls are Job losing his ch 10 children and health and possessions in a day. Walls are Mother Teresa struggling with 50 years of dryness and not feeling God. If you've never read her book, uh, it was written after she died uh, about her dark night or her wall, well worth reading. But again, sometimes when we, when we think about stages, um, we may find ourselves going back to earlier periods of our lives as we begin to work through this where we didn't complete perhaps something from an earlier stage. We don't just automatically move from one stage to another. Uh, people get stuck. It's very easy to get stuck and um, uh, and get fixated at a stage because we don't do the kind of work, internal work, that's required. And again, that's why 85% uh, of folks often get stuck at a wall because and not go on this great adventure God has for them because they don't have the theology, the framework, a big, big enough God to go through it. But let me say it as clearly as I can. There is no way to grow into being a mature mother and father of the faith without walls. And there surely is no way to grow into becoming a great leader for Jesus without going through walls. You won't find it anywhere in scripture uh, nor in history. Now, the reason many of us get stuck at walls, uh, or that is around the suffering of walls, is it's related to our families <clears throat> and our church genogram and our cultural genograms. I mean, most of our families uh, and churches didn't teach us how to cope with suffering or loss or, or death. I mean, our family genograms, for example, play a big role. Uh, and again, it's often unconscious, but there's kind of a contract. We kind of internalize this, hey, if I act correctly, if I'm of a good heart and I have good intentions, everything in life is going to work out. And then kind of a church genogram is, hey, you, you obey, you follow the rules, you follow Jesus, you won't suffer, at least too much anyway. Uh, you'll, you'll actually get blessed and uh, you'll be healthy. You'll be, you know, you'll be prosperous. And again, the definition of what is victory, I, uh, how we define victory, it, it's interesting how subtle it is. You, you and I may not be health and wealth preachers or have bought into the American prosperity gospel uh, where if you follow Jesus, you'll be wealthy and own a big home and drive beautiful cars. But it's interesting how subtle that is in all of us, that if I kind of a contract, if I be good, God's going to bless me or not let the suffering cross a certain line. And then, of course, is the Western culture genogram, which is uh, prosperity and success and bigger, better, younger. It's basically about control. Uh, we want to feel like we're in control in a predictable world. But, and as a result, most people's spiritual practices actually, you know, to get what I want in life, I'm going to pray. I'm going to make sure that I don't get what I don't want. Uh, and so even as a pastor leader, that, it's so interesting how my prayer life and devotions uh, is so I feel close to God. So I intercede, so I get certain outcomes. Uh, 
and I actually then find scriptures to support that. And the wall, when it comes into our lives, just brings the collapse of all these faulty assumptions. And as you all know, we can all find a verse to build a theology on, uh, but the wall just brings a collapse. That is my only word I can think of, of this faulty theology. Uh, and, and as more than one pastor has said to me that when they hit walls, uh, what they do is they power through them. I, I power, the word is power through them. In fact, that's, I wouldn't have used that word, but that is how I prided myself for many years. I just, I'm just going to bust through these walls in the name of Jesus. Uh, but really the best way to understand what's happening at the wall, what God's trying to do in us is the famous work of John of the Cross in Dark Night of the Soul. If you've never read that work, uh, get a copy of it. It's really worth reading slowly and prayerfully. And his basic argument is that walls or dark nights of the soul, as he calls them, is the ordinary way we grow in Jesus. It's the way it's the way all of us grow. There are no exceptions uh, if we're going to grow into maturity. In fact, a failure to understand walls or dark nights is one of the reasons many people start but don't finish well. Uh, listen, our God is far wilder than we've been taught. But dark night or uh, our ways are God's way of rewiring and purging our affections and passions, right? It's John of the Cross. And, and uh, uh, the great example we use in the course is the story of Abraham. And uh, as he is uh, at the wall at 120 years old and being asked by God to sacrifice his son, his only son whom he loves, Isaac. Uh, but actually, he, he's called the father of us all in Scripture for good reason. In fact, five times in Romans chapter 4. And we see him hitting multiple walls in his life because we just don't have one wall in our Christian life. We have multiple times we hit walls. In fact, the, the, journey, the Christian journey is not you go through this journey once. It's, it's cyclical. We go through it multiple times in our Christian life until we will you know, many walls, some which will last for quite some time. Uh, so we see, for example, in Genesis 12, Abraham, at least his first wall that we know about in uh, at the age of 75, where he's uh, called by God to leave his uh, everything he's known, his country, his people, his father's household, and go to an unknown place. And then he hits a second wall in Genesis 13 as he's, as he's got to depart uh, from Lot, his nephew, as their herdsmen are fighting with each other. There's not room for both of them. So there's a split there. The third wall is the infertility of his wife, Sarah, which lasts for 25 years. I mean, that's a long wall. And yet God promised he'd be a father of nations. His fourth wall, at least, is his marital tension, uh, with a, this child born out of wedlock, Ishmael, and he's got to send Ishmael away, and he loves Ishmael. And then Genesis 22 is at least his fifth wall when he's got to sacrifice Isaac and uh, his only son. And I, if I was him, uh, I'm sorry, he's perhaps 110 to 113 years old at this point, not 120, but he's living in a tent. He's only got one son and another, you know, very difficult wall. And, and uh, I get, if I, I just... I, I, if I was me, I'd say, oh, God, come on. This, I've been through enough dark nights. I'm mature enough. We don't need to go any further. Uh, but Abraham, if you read the story of Genesis 22 closely, he doesn't argue. He doesn't delay. He doesn't resist. He, he's not angry or bitter. He doesn't shrink back. He, he, he responds. Uh, he surrenders. He, uh, he doesn't hold on to what he's clinging to, uh, his only son, you see, the point is God loves you enough to strip you of that which keeps you from him, even good things. Uh, and what we think is often the worst for us turns out to be the best. And what we think sometimes is the best for us turns out to be the worst. And John of the Cross's uh, work, which is, again, the reason it's lasted 500 years, is because he, he writes about and talks about how it's it's in these at these walls or these dark nights that God is purging our palate, our taste buds. And he, he's uh, changing them so that we don't love and taste the things of the world like we used to, but we actually, we have a this taste bud for Jesus and for God that we've not had before. We can taste and see the Lord is good. We're being stripped of things um, that keep us from a higher degree of love and communion with him. Uh, there's, a, there's a stripping is causing us to, of our, again, our false self, Things are being pulled out of us that can be pulled out no other way. Uh, so we can become the new women, the new men he's called us to be. He's not simply restraining our flesh. He's actually pulling out some roots. That's what makes it so painful. Um, and John of the Cross gives this whole list of, of, of 
sins that God's pulling out of us in dark nights that can come out of us no other way. Things like pride and impatience and greed and uh, spiritual gluttony and spiritual envy and sloth. And I mean, it's so deep because it's not just about, uh, you know, us by our, the sheer force of our wills changing ourselves. It's God pulling out of us this deep sense of self-will and control and replacing it with the life of Jesus. It's the very opposite of we can't power through this thing. It's God pulling something out of us. You see, the whole goal of life from God's perspective is that we would live in loving union with him. I mean, our God delights in endlessly transforming us on this earth. You know, Romans 8, 29 and 30, you know, God's predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. We revel in the hope of one day actually experiencing the very glory of God himself in Romans 5, 2. In other words, you have a destiny and I have a destiny. And that's to be given a new body and a new heaven and new earth transfigured into the glory of God. Uh, and and the, God is, is determined to bring you to glory and me to glory. And so he is just endlessly and wildly transforming you and me, but in ways that we never would have chosen ourselves. Uh, and he invites us to surrender to him, to surrender so we can be in loving union with him, to empty ourselves. That's why one of the great verses in scripture is Jesus, when he's talking about discipleship in the gospel says, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Just think about that for a moment. That's Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's really the wall. Uh, I lose my life. I let it go. And, and thus I find it. So instead of attaching to my goals and my direction for how this, my life and the ministry should go forward, I actually release attachment to any particular outcome. I don't try to manipulate or predict how it's going to flow out. And I trust God's going to orchestrate all things good in his timetable for his glory and the good of the world. Instead of praying to get what I want, I actually, sur I actually surrender my will to God's will, trusting again that he's orchestrating all things for our good, his glory, and the good of the world, according to his timetable. Instead of devising new programs and looking for a quick hire, I'm not that I'm against new programs, but instead of devising new programs out of anxiety and looking for a quick hire or fix to manage the mess and mystery around me, mystery of God often, I'm gonna let God deal with me and my ambition and my impatience. Uh, in fact, impatience has rightly been defined as the refusal to endure. Instead of that, I'm gonna trust him. Uh, that God's orchestrating all things for our good, his glory, and the good of the world. And uh, I'm going to grow in faithfulness and worship him and serve him. A great word in scripture is hupomoni uh, in the Greek, which means patient endurance. It's a great word. Look it up. Revelations 1.9. We want to mature in patient endurance. You see, in, in, at walls or in dark nights, God's invading you. God's invading me. He's emptying you so he can fill you. Our image of God is totally transformed. Uh, so often our image of God are projections and illusions that we project onto him about who he is. And really the spiritual life in many ways has rightly been said. It's, 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 the, it's the withdrawal of projections we have about him, uh, which are often untrue. And uh, in fact, so often... Uh, it's been said a large part of religion is projection. It says a lot more about us than about God. And our ideas about God are so often distorted by personal needs and bad experiences in our histories and parents and teachers. And, um, and there's just time to move on. But God's ways are bigger than you can think. God's, God's ways, God, who God is, is so much higher than us. He, he, we can't manipulate God. He can't control him. We can't pin him down. We can't predict him. He's unfathomable. He's God. He's not like any finite, limited things. God is God. We say God is good and God is love and God is Father. That is just so much larger than we could ever imagine. And he's and so in dark nights and walls, he's he's stretching our hearts wide enough. He he's stretching our souls to to, to absorb a bit more of his incomprehensibility. You know, his inexhaustibility, his infiniteness. That's why when some people quit God, 
they're actually getting closer to the real God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's revealed himself. And there's a revelation of God that can only come through walls uh, and suffering. And Abraham learns at his wall that God is Jehovah Jireh. In fact, it's fascinating to see how at each of his walls, Abraham has a revelation of God. And he sees God who is the Lord who provides. Now, again, there's one thing knowing about God. There's another thing to know God. We may know about God who provides, but there's another thing to know God who provides. Uh, where And we, we know things deeply in our being through dark nights. That's why I, I love, uh, I've so loved these, you know, past year studying cosmology and looking at videos of what discoveries out of the Hubble and deep space and how big the universe is. Because yes, and I, then I read scriptures like his ways are beyond tracing out. Again, how big our God is. And so the invitation at our walls is to let go and trust God, even when we don't know how or when it will work out or what the working out will even look like. And John of the Cross writes about how to be tested by God at walls is a compliment. It's a privilege. It's actually a must for leaders. And he talks about two levels of dark nights. People who go through walls are dark nights of the soul. Some it's, are a very few are granted such heavy dark nights, it's almost violent. And if not by the grace of God, they wouldn't even survive. And he refers to it as being entrusted with that level of suffering. And I've seen that to be true with a few individuals. But those who stay with God in it are... Uh, boy, does God do some amazing things in them. And so we want to integrate, not minimize or stuff or deny. We want to integrate the walls and the suffering of those walls that come to us who are in leadership uh, because God comes in darkness as well as light. Just look at Psalm 18. You know, he made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Uh, Gregor of Nyssa wrote a tremendous work on the life of Moses. Uh and how Moses approaches the thick darkness where God dwells in Exodus 20, and how we need darkness as much as we need night, um, a light. We need darkness as much as we need light. And uh, so our work at the wall is to persevere and stay with Jesus. Um, boy, and that sure does apply for us in leadership. In other words, our faith is not in our love for him. That's what we, one of the big things we learn here. We don't want to have our faith in our love for him because our love for him is frail, it's faltering, and it's fickle. Our faith is in his love for us, which is steadfast, faithful, and persevering. In other words, he perseveres in his love for us. That's what we bank on, and so we stay with him at the wall. There are rich treasures at the wall if we stay with him. In fact, I promise you, you will not recognize yourself on the other side. You'll become the extraordinary human being God intends. And you'll end up in places you never dreamed of, with people you never imagined. And it will be good. God does have an incredible future for you and for me. But the way he's going to get you there is to transform you through walls that he will allow to come into your life because he loves you and is committed to conforming you to the image of his son and bringing you to glory uh, to reflect the very image of Jesus. So I'd like to end our time with a minute of silence. Uh, of being still before the Lord. I can't think of no better response here as we close. But before I do, again, let me remind you to go and download a free session of the EH Spirituality course and a free session video at emotionallyhealthy.org preview. Even if you're alone, just check it out to get started. I think you'll be glad you did. But I want to invite you to take one minute. And as a wise mentor of mine said years ago, if our spirituality is to make suffering bearable, it must first help us embrace it and not fight it. Because our spirituality invites us, and our relationship with Jesus invites us to engage with the questions suffering asks of us. So take a deep breath. I want to invite you to open up your palms up before God. And we're going to take a moment of stillness and silence before him. And we want to empty ourselves of our self-will and surrender ourselves to Jesus' will. We want to surrender our ambition, our plans for the day to his I love what Meister Eckhart wrote in the 1300s. Restlessness never arises within you except from self-will, whether you realize it or not. So if you're not driving, let me invite you to close your eyes. Uh, and let's be still and silent before the Lord for one minute.
Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you and have a wonderful day.